Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Monica Pika and I'm with Saks Healthcare and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. Firstly, on behalf of Philips and Saks Communications, we want to thank all of our frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping all of us through this very difficult time. We are truly, truly indebted to all of you. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded, and an online archive of today's event will be available soon after the session. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and click Enter. Our speakers will try to answer as many questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. If you experience technical difficulties, please use the Tech Support tab also on the right side of your screen. Please use the Tech Support tab for your technical questions. If you are having trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen if you're using a PC or Command R if you're using a Mac. And very important, please make sure you're not behind a firewall as this will prevent you from seeing the slides and please use a Chrome browser for the best experience. Our moderator today is Jose Morales. Mr. Morales is a respiratory therapy supervisor at South Miami Hospital. In this capacity, Mr. Morales coordinates and plans all activities for respiratory services, pulmonary lab, and pulmonary rehab within the departments and throughout the hospital. Additionally, he is flight and transport respiratory therapist. Mr. Morales holds an academic position as an adjunct faculty member at Miami-Dade College. Welcome, Jose. Good afternoon. Thank you, Monica, for that very kind introduction. Our speakers today will be Maureen Littner, and we'll be joining Dr. Blank later on for questions and answers. Speaking today on a very timely topic regarding non-invasive ventilation from hospital to home, reducing COPD admission, is a colleague and friend, Maureen Littner. Maureen Littner is currently the pulmonary disease coordinator at South Miami Hospital in Miami, Florida. She also is part of the Lung Health Outpatient Resource Center. In this role, Ms. Littner manages the pulmonary health of patients transitioning from hospital to home, as well as helping patients manage their diseases at home. She's an active member of the AARC Pulmonary and Disease, and Disease Education. Also was a finalist at the AARC National Respiratory Patient Advocacy Award. She has presented several local and national meetings and has published abstracts in respiratory care. Our speaker has disclosed no relevant financial uh, relationships. This activity has been approved for continuing education. Accredited statements are listed on the slides. Um, support for this educational activity has been pro provided by Philips. At this time, I would like to turn, it over, turn over the presentation to our speaker, Maureen Littner. Good afternoon, and thank you all for attending. I am so grateful to be here today and have this opportunity to share and discuss a topic that I not only believe in, but I'm passionate about for more than 30 years, non-invasive ventilation. I would like to thank Saks Healthcare and Philips for this opportunity, and I appreciate everything you all do and being here today. So let's get started. Our learning objectives today are to describe the clinical benefits of non-invasive ventilation and discuss the differences in terminology between hospital non-invasive ventilation BiPAP and home non-invasive ventilation BiPAP. I also wanna share some of strategies in reducing COPD readmissions and how, non how a non-invasive program can be beneficial to all of our stakeholders. At the latter part of our discussion, my colleague, Jose, will share some ventilation concerns we have all faced during this COVID era. In addition, I'm happy to have one of our own pulmonologists, Dr. Jackie Blank, who is very well versed for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So historically speaking, non-invasive ventilation has been around for decades. 
as you can all see back in the 30s and 50s, we you were utilizing the iron lung, especially during the polio epidemic. We started building our intensive care units relatively around the 70s and IPBB treatments were being used for positive pressure and we established our ICUs back then. It was the 80s and 90s where we started using CPAPs and BiPAPs were used primarily for obstructive sleep apnea, but latter came into our hospital arena. Through the years, we have had a significant burst in, especially in our technology. So look at this screen here, and where are you all today? Are you back in the 80s with some of the old sleep devices we had to manipulate to use at bedside? Are you, are you now with the latest and greatest technologies that have helped us, especially during this COVID era? Today, in our healthcare arena, we're continually faced with new challenges. Our COPD population has many of their own due to part of this pandemic. Many of our COPD patients prescribed non-invasive ventilation are hesitant in carrying out their own therapies because they believe that they are getting invasive ventilation. Now more than ever, it's more important to help educate our COPD patients and families to understand the differences of invasive versus non-invasive. So they can make an informed decision regarding their own prescribed therapy and care. Keep in mind the main difference between non-invasive ventilation and invasive ventilation comes primarily from the fact that we don't use an endotracheal tube, which is passed through the mouth and trachea. Instead of using the endotracheal tube, we use an interface, most commonly a face mask, to make that connection between the ventilator and the patient. We do not use we prevent intubation. So what is non-invasive ventilation? By definition, it's the application of positive pressure we provide ventilatory support through that upper airway using a mask or similar device. On, on the screen, you'll see the helmet that is commonly used in Europe. You have the total face mask. You have different degree face masks, nasal masks, and over to the right of the screen, you'll see a mouthpiece ventilation, which works fantastic for our, our neuromuscular patients. They can use the mouthpiece ventilation during the day with their prescription, and then at night, they can use one of the other interfaces. What are the benefits of non-invasive ventilation? We all know it buys you time. But most importantly, you can achieve the same physiological effects as if they were being on an invasive ventilator, but you're avoiding all those life-threatening risks associated with that artificial airway. It will reduce your ventilator-associated events. It helps reduce the need for sedation. The greatest thing, or one of the greatest things, is that patient can still maintain communication and swallowing reduce your hospital length of stay and with the new technology we've learned you know we can now allow our patients to have breaks off it and be placed on a high flow nasal cannula it allows the nurses to pr provide their medication administration feeding and oral hygiene some contraindications we all must keep in mind we have absolute and we have relative. We all know that with, with positive pressure, you have to make sure that your patient is hemodynamically stable and that they don't have a systolic or they are hypotensive because you run the risk of decreasing your venous return. Therefore, you can put them in an unfavorable situation. If you need to intubate the patient to protect the airway, non-invasive would be a, not, uh, a contraindication. Anyone that has a life-threatening refractory hypoxemia or copious secretions as well, or facial burns, would not benefit from non-invasive ventilation. We say relative 
uh, contraindications because we know that when someone's short of breath, there are severe anxieties. Patients get claustrophobic with a mask strapped onto their face. And then we have morbid, severe obesity, which can be very challenges, challenging to us. Acute respiratory failure comes in different severities. And as you see, when we apply respiratory support for gas exchange, it does buy us time. Our goal with non-invasive often is to reverse the underlying cause. Sometimes it's a very mild, acute distress, and you, you're able to successfully manage that patient with just applying low flow oxygen therapy. But when it gets a little bit more severe, non-invasive ventilation is a good alternative. And it can minimize the potential injuries affected you know, that we could do from ventilator-induced lung injuries associated with your invasive procedures. So this, this is a picture, it's not our presidential election. It actually is the United States percentage of patients that have COPD. You know, there's nearly over 16 million people in the United States that age 18 or older that have already been diagnosed with COPD, that economic burden of COPD in the United States is high. And more than $52 billion are spent on direct and indirect costs. So where does non-invasive come into play with COPD patients? Should non-invasive be used? Let's review a little bit about our pulmonary terminology because sometimes we all get mixed up with the PEEPs, the CPAPs, the EPAPs, the BiPAPs, the IPAPs. So let's take break it down slowly from the beginning. We started off with CPAP, and CPAP is just that continuous positive airway pressure. By keeping things simple, you know, CPAP is just one flow of air. We're maintaining the upper airway open, and we're improving oxygenations by applying positive airway pressure. CPAP was very common, you commonly used for obstructive sleep apnea. But through the years, we've learned that even in rescue, they can use a high flow CPAP out in the field to help add positive pressure to improve oxygenation when someone's in acute distress. Bi-level or BiPAP applies two pressures. It applies an inspiratory pressure and an expiratory pressure. The difference of the two is how much pressure support you're providing that patient. And ultimately, augment and alveolar ventilation. The goal of BiPAP in the acute respiratory failure state is to improve oxygenation and to blow off the carbon dioxide. It's also used for sleep because when sleep patients needed high pressures on inspiration to overcome their apneas, it, it came into play back in the late, early, early 90s. We were seeing some benefits with patients that had underlying lung disease. They were able to um, improve their alveolar ventilation by utilizing the BiPAP. That's how it came into our hospital arena for utilizing as a rescue. The new mode of ventilation that's surfacing that helps treat acute respiratory hypercarbic failure and obstructive sleep apnea is called AVAPS AE. When bi-level or BiPAP fails or it's been trialed, AVAPS AE is a great alternative because the difference between BiPAP and AVAPS AE is that you are targeting a specific tidal volume and the pressure support that you are setting is actually adjusting for that patient's need to provide or guarantee that average volume. That's why it's called average volume assured pressure support. Target a specific tidal volume. And then you also treat the obstructive sleep apnea 
in the event when the patient's sleeping. What's the differences between non-invasive BiPAP in the hospital and in the home? Are they the same? No, they're not. In the hospital, non-invasive ventilation BiPAP is synonymous. A physician orders BiPAP, the therapist provide the equipment, the appropriate equipment they have available and that for utilizing non-invasive ventilation. But in the home, when a physician orders BiPAP for home, if they're not specific that they need non-invasive ventilation, typically a DME will provide what we call a respiratory assistant device or a RAD. A RAD is not the same as non-invasive ventilation. There's many sleep devices at home. And that's what we have to keep in mind when we, when we provide ventilatory support in the hospital for hypercarbic respiratory failure. The patient does well, but when we go to transition in from home, we need to make sure that we are maximizing that patient's needs and we are being patient-centered and patient-specific to their care and need as a transition from hospital to home. It may, the, the sleep device may not be able to ventilate them the same as the device in the hospital. There's many variations in setups from the hospital into home. What I'd like you all to keep in mind is that in the hospital, the, the masks and the interfaces that we use are what we call non-ventilated masks. And our circuits generally are where we would ventilate the CO2. So on the left side, left bottom portion of your, of your slide, you will see the expiratory port. That is where the patient exhales from in the hospital. On the right side of the screen is where you'll see tubing and it has a, an expiratory swivel adapter applied so that the patient may exhale through that. In addition to the masks that are used at home are ventilated masks. The circuit is not ventilated. So it's opposite from hospital to home. Also keep in mind, we, we change our oxygen modality from hospital to home. In the hospital, we have 50 PSI coming out of the wall. And in the home, the patients are, are generally bleeding in oxygen from their concentrator, which we know is not 100% FiO2. So you have to make sure that the patient is sufficiently being oxygenated. If, and then the oxygen ports in the back is where we would, on the bottom right corner, is where you would be applying the oxygen tubing. The hospital mask is non-ventilatory and the circuit is where we ventilate the CO2 out. In the home, it's the opposite. The mask is where the, is a ventilated mask. And keep in mind also with the severity of some of our COPD patients, in my experience that some of the sleep device or interfaces at home can work against us. It's not that the product isn't a fantastic product for sleep apnea, but when we have a severe hypercarbic respiratory failure patient, sometimes one interface may be better than another. And that's very important why we follow up with our patients at home and we randomly will check the end tidal CO2s if available. Understanding therapy options. When a physician orders non-invasive at home, they have to be very specific. And they have to also, for our DMEs, often order a specific device. If they only ask for BiPAP alone, they're not gonna get a backup rate. The BiPAP ST will provide a backup respiratory rate for the patient. But what we have to keep in mind too with a BiPAP ST, is that sometimes the main, there are challenges with BiPAP STs 
because we don't want insufficient exhalation times to happen and lead to air trapping. If the patient successfully did well on a non-invasive mode in the hospital, the ideal would be to transition them to home on that same or similar device in the home. Across the continuum of care, non-invasive is expanding. We know we're now using it regularly out in the field with fire rescue, coming into our emergency rooms. Many hospitals have expedited their code rescue teams. Um, hospice is, is doing fantastic with non-invasive invasive transition. Many times our end stage patients and the severity of their illness may need a hospice intervention because they can get more the support and the extra resources they may need in the home. We have non-invasive working well in many of our uh, LTECs and then coming into our SNFs as well. This is the clinical practice guidelines. And I put this up there because the evidence-based gold guidelines pr provides strategies for healthcare providers worldwide to prevent, diagnose, and manage COPD. These are just a few examples that I found very beneficial in, in establishing a non-invasive program. And I just wanted to share them all with you. So how would you set up a non-invasive program in your own institution? Often, it, it starts with either initial case, and then you get the buy-in from your physicians. You can do, there's plenty of evidence based out now, now out there to support non-invasive ventilation. Majority of your non-invasive programs are driven by the respiratory departments, but you need your administration buy-in. And you need someone to spearhead this to help develop your protocols. This is an example of a very simple BiPAP algorithm, and it's to treat acute respiratory failure. You simply just set up your inclusion list and your exclusions or your contraindications, and you establish specific MD guidelines on how to apply by level. We're very successful in using a non-invasive program here, working very simple inspiratory and expiratory pressures, and then we had guidelines on how to adjust the settings accordingly to treat either the hypoxemia or the hypercarbic respiratory failure. In 2004, we saved $11 million published on, on decreasing uh, readmission, not a readmission, I apologize. We, we saved $11 million by not having to intubate the patients, which overall decreased length of stay as well. And that was just using a simple, basic, non-invasive algorithm. You have to keep things simple when you're treating non-respiratory failure in the hospital setting. Always go in twos. Keep it very simple. If the patient has oxygen problems, the two ways to improve oxygen, we all know, is you increase the FiO2 or you increase the mean airway pressure. And non-invasive can help do that. They have hypercarbic respiratory failure. We all know we increase the rate or we increase the minute ventilation and that can help blow off the carbon dioxide. You have many opportunities with non-invasive ventilation. Most importantly, to improve that quality and of that patient's outcome. There's, you want to decrease readmission rates, if at all possible, because we all know that we're all hit with hospital penalties these days. What exactly is AVAPS AE? AVAPS AE is a new mode of ventilation. And what it does is it treats respiratory failure and obstructive sleep apnea. It makes titration process with no IPAP adjustments needed at all. The greatest thing about, or one of the greatest things about AVAPS AE is that once it's applied to patients, 
It follows that disease progression as the patient's ventilation needs change. It can improve the patient's ventilation's efficacy and comfort, and it increases the safety on ventilating that patient because it is average volume assured. Some indications for AVAPS AE. These are different ICD-10s I wanted to share with you all that you can use the new AVAPS AE mode on. Neuromuscular and restricted diseases, COPD with respiratory failure, and then the hypoventilation syndrome. Initial AVAPS AE recommendation settings, we found it very useful to make what we call a buddy badge. Because there are few settings that you have to use in initiating AVAPS AE, we gave recommended settings as a, as a tool. They're not in stone, but it's a good starting on how to set up a patient on AVAPS AE. When a physician says, I have a patient, I want to try AVAPS AE, the most important question to you as a therapist to the physician is, okay, doctor, what tidal volume would you like? And where would you like to target your FiO2 or, or saturations? And then the therapist with standing orders or policies and procedure can start this recommended setting. It's very important to monitor the patient and, and select the appropriate interface for that patient. In the hospital, regardless where you work, most hospitals are now switching over to electronic medical records. If you have a fantastic device, but you have no means of ordering it, it's just as well not, it's not, there's no benefit. So it's very important with hospitals that regard, knowing their EMR, how to build with their IT team, how to set up and order a specific ventilator or a specific mode. You also have to have it, the education of your team on how to utilize the technology. Hospital trials on AVAX most importantly is that you want to set the patient up if possible to see if they're going to be able to handle the device anticipating a possible discharge with that device you optimize that patient's comfort settings monitor any clinical changes and you must educate 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 education starts from the beginning of application Everyone must have realistic expectations. We're not curing the disease as much as we're trying to improve their quality of life. But sometimes, you know, you know, it's a, it's a patient, you must educate your patient on the goals of non-invasive ventilation, so much so that they can make an informed consent on their own care. Social services and case management, can help with the, the process, the sooner the better to get the orders into your care management. This is where our nurse practitioners, PAs, and physicians are essential in their documentation. Non-invasive in the home is very time consuming, labor intensive, and expensive. We want to make sure that we get the orders early so that the case managers can start working on getting the device for the home Make sure that we have the supporting document. Soap notes are great in this scenario to show the disease process that, that you trialed and, and failed by BiPAP, and now you're going for AVAPS at home, and that you get that non-invasive device. This is an example of some supporting documentation. Patient does require non-invasive in the home. You can specify the actual device that you want, but also make sure that the patient was trialed and failed on BiPAP first, and that any interruption of their support could lead to an ultimate readmission or decline in their overall health status. 
I want to review one last time an AVAP's AE process. It starts with identification of the patient. Then we order the initial recommended settings and we monitor the patient. Hospital trial on AVAPS AE is performed when the DM with our own device if we have one or if the DME can bring in the device for monitoring. When they bring it in, we do our electrical safety checks and then we use their own device for monitoring, assessment, and education. The discharge home, follow up calls, and we utilize an outpatient lung resource center to do education and symptom management. Many of our DMEs have the care orchestrator that can provide printout uh, data on the patients as well. Success of a non invasive program. It starts with it needs to be COPD patient centered. We want to aim for self management. Keep in mind to motivate and um, engage them, coach them, try to stay as positive as possible. Our personnel knowledge is essential. Our respiratory therapists in the hospital and in the home all need to be educated. They are key for the ones that are setting up the devices. The MDs and the RNs, nurse practitioners and PAs, knowing how to order the devices successfully. In the hospital, we utilize, uh, we cohort our high acuity respiratory patients. If possible, that's a great way for safety. We also, the, you know, having the latest and greatest equipment and technology has made um, some definite changes with our success. Something we've learned through the years as well is that patients' adherence and compliance is a must. And a reasonable, realistic conversation must be done with these patients because if they're not willing and want to pursue non-invasive at home, it's, a, it's, it's a taxing and exhausting on the medical team. Try to get a piece of a de device that's gonna go sit in a closet. How we've tackled that particular situation is we get a verbal consent and we clearly document that we've had this conversation and that the patient's willing and ready to accept our therapies that they're gonna be using at home. Support and interest from our administration is very important and our other stakeholders. And then an outpatient follow-up is, is very important as well. There are many DME companies that are capable of providing statistics and data back to the physicians offices as well as you know provide us with end title co2s this is a two publications we're very proud of it was we opened up an outpatient lung resource center to help provide education and symptom management primarily to our copd population and we were very successful in decreasing our copd population primarily with our team of nurse practitioners, therapists, and physicians. And then what we did was we showed the following year sustainability of an outpatient lung resource center. And we, we saved $1.2 million by increasing our DRGs, not just COPD, but other pulmonary illnesses from three to 11. So having an outpatient lung resource center that where the patient can come in post-discharge can really be beneficial to any, any situation. It's not the device that impacts the patient outcomes. It's the operator's experience, expertise. So look at all those operators out there. Could it be an operator? -er? I can't stress enough how important it is to know and your equipment and the technology that you're utilizing. I want to share a non-invasive case study, and this just so happened to be on acute, on chronic respiratory distress. A hospital case was an 80-year-old female in acute respiratory distress. The nurses identified the patient was desatting, placed them on a 35% Veni mask, and asked for a blood gas. Once the blood gas was obtained, 
They recognized that this patient was in acute respiratory distress and failure at this point. The carbon dioxide level went to 102. So they identified and initiated their code rescue. What would you do? Well, we placed them on BiPAP 15 and 5. But look what happened. Now, how many of you, the CO2 went to 130. How many of you would intubate this person at this time? Or would you adjust the mode of ventilation? Well, I'm very happy to say that, it, you know, I, I work with some great therapists in my facility. And they took the challenge. And what they did was they changed the mode of ventilation because they're very skilled and knowledgeable in non-invasive. They switched the patient over to AVAPS AE. And in less than two hours, the patient blood gas abnormal or CO2 and oxygen improved. When you have carbon dioxide levels of 130, sometimes you have to also think, why is my CO2 up? Am I, am I ventilating the patient? And this is the take home for this particular case study. On BiPAP, are you giving the patient too much oxygen that's causing that CO2? Or, or are you giving them enough pressure support to get a good minute ventilation or a good exhaled tidal volume? On bi-level, that particular patient was only getting maybe six or seven liters for a minute ventilation. So we knew that was not going to be enough to blow off that carbon dioxide. Then when we switched them over to AVAPS, the minute ventilation almost doubled. The European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society clinical practice guidelines for non-invasive are for COPD and acute exacerbation. We want to prevent that acute respiratory acidosis. We want to try and prevent endotracheal intubation and any more clinical deterioration associated with that. It is an alternative for patients with severe acidosis and the more severe respiratory distress. We, have, we know there is evidence base to support cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Sometimes non-invasive with cardiac, cardiac pulmonary edema, it, we can turn that around within just a few hours when they're on the right modalities and the right pressures. Don't set yourself up for failure and leave the patient on the original prescribing pressures if you know that's not enough to optimize their ventilation. Keep in mind when you place a patient, particularly like say on BiPAP for a quick rescue of 12 and five or 15 and five, you may have to go higher on that inspiratory pressure to get the patient to a better optimized ventilation, minute ventilation. We also talk about home non-invasive ventilation. It is used for the chronic stable hypercarbic patient. It success, it's, it's also suggested that we use it in patients with COPD following life-threatened episodes of acute hypercarbic respiratory failure. If you have that patient that's been admitted more than once or twice that year for acute respiratory failure, please consider non-invasive ventilation for the home. It suggests we titrate or normalize or reduce the CO2 as much as possible. Follow up with your outpatient lung resource centers or do your outpatient calls or can keep a good continuum of care with your DMEs. That way you can report back to each other and maintain that patient in the home environment safely. We also suggest using fixed pressure support and mode, first choice ventilator mode on patients using um, hospital, I mean, home non-invasive ventilation. Be proactive versus reactive. The earlier you identify these patients, the better you are in improving their quality of life. Many of our physicians that are knowledgeable on the different non-invasive modalities are doing just that. They're preventing hospital admissions. Keep the continuum of care going. If the patient has to take a few weeks and go into a LTAC or SNF or rehab, be proactive 
and help them knowing when they're going to be discharged so that continuum of care from those facilities will continue when they get home and do the follow-up phone calls. Keep, keep a good rapport with your, not, with your DMEs. Make that patient agree for their adherence and compliance and utilize your outpatient lung resources if you have one for communication and keeping the, the patient's outcomes as best as possible. So now what I'd like to do is pass the, the mic back to Jose, my colleague, and, and he's gonna discuss a few things, what we've learned in COVID-19 error. Thank you, Mary, for that most timely and thoughtful provoking presentation. What we've learned in COVID-19 in the past year, this is a very large and, and time consuming topic, which we're gonna just, I'm just gonna try to talk a, a little bit about, and I'm sure I'm gonna, uh, add a flavor or, or entice, entice the actual audience as to what we do, what we have done. Again, it's a very large topic to talk to and uh, you know we have a short amount of time and leave some uh, room for questions and answers. So it's been a year since we started our COVID pandemic. Over this long haul, we've had many different uh, consensus as what to do and what not to do. We've gone to you know, patient comes in an emergency room, we find out he has COVID, uh, viral pneumonia, and he's severely hypoxic. Well, the first thing we did back then was, you know, we couldn't use high flow, we couldn't use PiPi because they were aerosol producing a generator. So we go ahead and straight and intubate these patients. Well, from that point to now that we are at present time, we actually found out that we can actually use high flow nasal cannulas and BiPAPs. High flow nasal cannulas are not aerosolized producing apparatuses, but they humidify the airway tract, provide large amounts of oxygen, and also provide greater leader flows. And we actually were able to accomplish using these uh, high flow nasal cannulas, especially on the second wave. Because remember, on the first wave, when we started getting hit with all these COVID patients, we were running out of ventilators because we were intubating a whole bunch of people left and right. So what other means of ventilatory and oxygenation support can we have used? Well, we started getting ready for the second wave uh, to come in and we decided, listen, we need to come up with something because we have only X amount of ventilators. And as we saw, these people were not actually making it out of uh, being intubated for a prolonged period of time, high FiO2s, high PEEPs. So we decided to incorporate in the second wave, hey, let's start using high flow nasal cannulas. On top of that, we also started incorporating and using our BiPAPs. How can we have accomplished this? Well, in depending on your institutions, but I know in our institutions, we have several uh, areas that have actual uh, negative pressure rooms. If they don't have pressure negative rooms, we do have floors that can convert into a negative flow. And we added some HEPA filters uh, machines in these areas that do not have any a negative pressure uh, equipment to be able to suck up all these air that comes, uh, you know, when, when, when these patients are in these rooms. On top of that, we were also using with high-flown nasal cannula with these patients, providing uh, surgical masks as they wear the high-flown nasal cannula. On the BiPAPs, we were actually putting filters on there to prevent on exhalation, you know, um, the virus to be spread out in the room to help decrease the transmission to our staff because our staff is the most important part and the uh, most important persons uh, dealing with this uh, pandemic, and if you don't have any respiratory therapists, or you don't have any doctors, or you don't have any nurses, hey, you're not gonna be able to take care of these patients. So we were providing filters on our BiPAPs to be able to decrease the amount of uh, uh, COVID transmission to these patients. On top of that, PPE was the most important part of equipment that our staff went out to these floors to be able to uh, help these patients with COVID positive patients. Then again, we were not using aerosols because aerosols do produce aerosol particles. So later on, we determined what can we do to be able to provide aerosol treatments because we were also seeing not only, you know, these patients that do not have any uh, COPD uh, ailments, uh, they didn't need aerosols. But then when you get these COPD patients that ended up having COVID-19 and ended up with a viral pneumonia, uh, we needed to provide aerosols for them because they were in exacerbations. So we came up and we started putting filters on the uh, aerosol parts to prevent, again, uh, the exposure to staff as they're walking in, doing all these therapies and providing all these therapies for these patients uh, that are COVID positives. We also have used 
proning, not only in the intensive care unit while these patients are intubated for COVID, but also on our COVID regular wards. Proning has been, you know, part of us since even before COVID-19, uh, providing uh, oxygenation to these patients uh, that need to improve oxygenation in the intensive care unit when intubated in ARDS. So we actually incorporated uh, the proning uh, benefit of that part in our non-intubated patients on the floors. We had patients on high flow nasocannulas, on BiPAPs, regular oxygen. We would go in and make rounds and tell them, okay guys, you need to prone yourselves as much as you can during the day. And at night, it would be best, it would be very beneficial if you sleep on your stomach. But of course, adherence to uh, proning, some people couldn't tolerate it. If they couldn't tolerate proning, we're asking them to at least lay on their sides. And this was actually successful. We were able to get a lot of patients to improve the oxygenation by just doing these techniques. Also with our COVID intubated ICU patients, we were having trouble getting, uh, weaning them off the vents, those that were able and capable of being weaned off the vent. So we also incorporated our cough assist. Everybody knows about the cough assist that is mostly used for neuromuscular patients, but we found a great, excellent source to help us with these COVID patients because of their thick taste, uh, tenacious secretions that they had. So we're actually incorporating uh, cough assist to help uh, these patients while they're on CPAP to be able to get all of that secretions to come up and help them uh, and help us actually extubate these patients with success out of that. Also after extubations, we were even incorporating OPEP to be able to provide a little bit of a positive pressure and uh, mobilizing of secretions. Uh, the last part would be ECMO. I know a uh, personal uh, experience as being a transport therapist. I did transport quite a few uh, patients over to ECMO centers uh, that needed ECMO that we had, you know, COVID positives on, on the maxed out on our full support uh, ventilatory. It's still mixed feelings. I st we still need, uh, you know, the, the, the actual data from these ECMO centers uh, to see if these patients uh, which ones did make it, which ones did not, and see if it was actually beneficial uh, for these patients in COVID positives. So this is a very big, big uh, topic that I know everybody nowadays is interested to learn. What is our techniques? What are what do we have done? Just to let you know, just to surmise this, uh, we have actually incorporated all these, uh, as you see on the slide, to the benefit to help our patients uh, survive this uh, COVID pandemic. Hey, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all healthcare workers, wherever you guys are working, Europe, here, the Netherlands, all around the world. Thank you for everything that you guys do. And thank you for all that commitment, especially to our staff here in uh, South Miami Hospital. They really went out of their world to fight this COVID pandemic. All right, now I will actually tell you how would you um, be able to obtain your CEs. So continuing education for nurses and uh, respiratory therapists is provided for one contact hour. To obtain your CE credits, go to www.saxtesting.com slash bow. You will need to register at the site. Complete your evaluation, and upon successful completion, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. Again, the support of this educational activity has been provided by Philips. Also, archive version. An archive version, on-demand version, will be available on betteroutcomes.org. An email will be sent to all registrants when it is available. The on-demand version will be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. At this time, we'll turn it over to our panelists for our question and answers. So to start off one question, uh, this is uh, Dr. Blank. This is a one question for you, sir. Uh, how do you determine if a non-invasive fails in the hospital setting, what other means of ventilatory support we, can you order for this patient for home use? Well, if non-invasive is failing in the hospital setting, it's not gonna work at home. And basically when we decide to use non-invasive ventilation in the hospitals because they are in, 
in acute respiratory failure or exacerbation of chronic respiratory failure with an acute event. So you, we first have to, you know, get the patients go, uh, stable enough to go home and then decide if this patient will need support at home. The decision to give them support for home would be the persistence of an elevated CO2 once they're stable. Uh, the idea of non-invasive ventilation is to unload the respiratory muscles and improve the chemosensitivity of the to CO2 in the brain in order for the patient to be able to function better. Uh, if you have to look at the lungs uh, or as, uh, as the respiratory system in two uh, as a two-part system, you have the lungs, which the which is the unit of gas exchange, and then you have the respiratory muscles who move those lungs in order to to bring in and out air. If the unit of gas exchange is not stable enough, you know whatever we do with respiratory muscles is going to fail. Most people are with COPD they are not CO2 retainers. Some of them with advanced COPD would be chronically CO2 retainers and they will benefit from non-invasive ventilation. Some people who are not CO2 retainers come to the hospital with an acute event and that makes them acutely a CO2 retainer. And those are the ones who do better with non-invasive ventilation. You know, other, other treatments are basically what we do depending on their disease. You know, if they have an acute pneumonia, if they have a, a exacerbating bronchospasm, CHF, and arrhythmia, you'll treat them. Thank you, Dr. Blank. I have a question here from David. To assure volume, does AVAT target tidal volume or alveolar ventilation? Maureen? So a AVAPS AE is average volume assured. So it's targeting specifically the tidal volume. And it's adjusting the pressure support to, to achieve that tidal volume. AVAPS AE is typically set in an auto track mode. So it auto tracks off. Always keep in mind with non invasive ventilation, we have to have a spontaneously breathing patient but we're targeting specifically the tidal volume in the AVAPS AE. And ultimately, by targeting a specific tidal volume, unlike BiPAP, where you only have one, your target, the pressure support and your tidal volume is constantly changing, by targeting a specific tidal volume, you have typically a better minute ventilation overall. Thank you, Maureen. I have several questions regarding AVAPS AE, regarding the different pressures. Does one equal the other? Is it the mass max equals the pressure minimum? Is Can you please give a brief explanation, Maureen, regarding all these different type of pressures? I think we have some confused audiences as to what is max, what is equal, what is not equal to. So how we typically would set up starting an AVAPS AE is that we would set a specific tidal volume. Then we have to set high and low pressure support and EPAP. So in my example of our recommended settings, an old rule of thumb was that the highest maximum pressure support plus the minimum EPAP is your maximum pre pressure in the device. So if you had 26 of the high pressure support and four of the E, that would be 30, and that would be your maximum pressure. Thank you, Mary. So the EPAP, the EPAP, keep in mind, is going to fluctuate when they are sleeping. Even in an obstructive, for the obstructive sleep apnea patient, it maintains that airway open. Thank you. Hmm? Mary, can you please quickly and briefly explain what is OPEP, its benefits? Oscillating po positive expiratory pressure. There's many different devices that are used out there to help mobilize secretions and do a little bit of lung recruitment. We use different OPEP devices. I don't want to name specific brands, but it's particularly with patients that have some secretions. We like to use that as different devices to help 
with mobilizing secretions and lung recruitment. Thank you, Mary. I have a question here from Dawn that asks, we have a few patients that is uh, that are strategy units. They go home with a rental, so patients with co-insurances and deductibles can't afford it. I guess it's regarding how can we be able to get, a, let's say, a trilogy for patients they are going home. The documentation, uh, the, best, the best people, honestly, to talk about getting a device for home is working with your DMEs. You know, we've learned, you know, it's nice to have uh, the DMEs are very knowledgeable of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Um, and they, they've worked with many of the different insurances out there and the regulatory. What we have to keep in mind, too, as far as the patient's adherence and um, compliance, if the patient is given a device and they're not using it, Medicare may pull that device out of the home. So you need, that's another reason to, you know, to talk to your patients and make sure that they're going to be compliant and adherent to the devices that you're ordering. It is labor intensive and, and the physicians must show clinical documentation to support any device in the home and medical necessity. So keep that in mind as well. Dr. Blank, here's a, here's a question for you. Very excellent question. You as a pulmonologist, what are your concerns when you're sending in a hypercarbic patient home on non-invasive ventilation? Well, first of all, you need to be sure that they're stable. So even though they're hypercarbic, the pH should be normal. So there will be a compensated hyper, a respiratory acidosis, number one. Number two, we should follow up with this patient two weeks and probably four weeks later to see if they continue to be hypercarbic and they, or not. Because if they corrected the hypercarbia, they might not need the, the ventilatory support anymore. Uh, we need to be sure that they have a, that the main reason why they came to the hospital is resolved. You know, sometimes you have a very severely debilitated COPD patient who has chronic hypercarbia and has a, you know, just an arrhythmia that will put them in the hospital. And in that case, you take the opportunity to treat that arrhythmia, improve the treatment of his COPD and send them home with non-invasive ventilation because that will keep them home and will prevent them from deteriorating. In the long run, will unload their respiratory muscles a period of time during the day, and that will improve their quality of life. That will allow them to, to do more things during the day, to be able to be more mobile and active. And also will improve their nutrition because people with advanced COPD tend to have a very high metabolic uh, consumption due to respiratory work. If, um, so uh, we need to be sure that they're stable. We need to be sure that they understand what they're doing with this device and what the purpose of the treatment. We need to be sure that they're followers and outpatient. And we need to be sure that they have other treatments that will keep them uh, well, you know, depending on, on the disease. Now, can, I something, can I mention something also is you can utilize your pulmonary rehab for education and follow-up as well. And the, um, the new grads, the students and stuff, you all are our futures. So I hope you can embrace this, the new technologies and make a difference as well. Oh, there's so many questions in a short little time. I think I have one more room for one more question. And will be, this will be directed to both Dr. Blank and Maureen. Will AVAPs work for non-compliant COPD lungs? We have used on a palliative side, non-invasive ventilation. Patients, um, non-invasive just to try to buy them time for lack of better words for their quality of life um i've used um it was, i had a pulmonary fibrosis patient that was actually approved on the palliative side and and their their life expectancy wasn't very long but it was approved and different hospices hospices may trans allow a non-invasive to continue 
for a short period of time. So it, it's every case is case specific and every case is case centered. So you must work with the physicians and, and your resources that are available. Yeah, AVAS would be particularly helpful because you'll be able to, to target a minute ventilation appropriately and you have a variable uh, pressure adjusting to the desired uh, tidal volume. So, in, in a non-compliant lung, uh, you, when you use just a pressure device, you, you can be sure that you're delivering the, the, the target ventilation. And sometimes the patient cannot tolerate the high pressure that you need to do for, uh, to give that patient to be able to, to set it up. You know, remember that what we're doing here is trying to unload the respiratory muscles, and by unloading the respiratory muscles, decrease the, the sensation of dyspnea of the patient and improve a little bit their, their well-being. Depending on the severity and progression of their disease, we'll be able to be more helpful or not. In COPD, uh, most of the people we've, we've who have very high compliance are obese patients. You know, they, they what we used to call the blue bloaters. And they will need, a, when we used to use BiPAPs, we needed to use very high pressures in order to vent them. With AVAPs, we, we probably have more guarantee of that they'll do better. So I think it's a good device and it's a good resource. Thank you, anyone, everyone. I know there was still a lot of questions out there, but unfortunately, our questions and answers has come to an end. I'm gonna turn it over to Monica for her concluding remarks. Thank you. And this concludes our webinar for today. I'd like to remind the audience that there is a survey for you at the conclusion that will pop up immediately. And we would greatly appreciate you sharing your opinions on today's webinar. We value your feedback. Thank you again. And on behalf of our presenters and Sex Healthcare Communications and our sponsor, Philips, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>